Okay, good morning everybody. Okay, I think we'll start. Thank you, Professor Elliott. Um, so we are, it's 20 past nine. The, the, the planned start for the, the session was nine o'clock. Uh, I, I think this is fashionably late. Um, we've got plenty of sort of wriggle room during the day, so, so, so I, we, we can easily make up the time. And I think we all felt that it was good to let everyone have a coffee and, and get ready for what I think is going to be a great day. Um, welcome to you all. Welcome to, um, particularly warm welcome to any new members, um, uh, new delegates. Uh, a lot of you are familiar faces, but, but, um, but it's great to see new faces as well. Um, this is a hybrid meeting, so there are, um, I believe, uh, 70 or so people online, uh, uh, as well as the 175 or so of you here today. And I think we're sort of looking at 250 or, or more uh, delegates today, which is, I think, record numbers. I'd also like to particularly welcome uh, and acknowledge the support from industry. Um, we've got uh, really good financial support this year and funding to support the conference. And, um, and they have stands in the sort of coffee area. And uh, it would be great if people can acknowledge that and, uh, and, and chat to them. And the charities are also represented in, in the coffee area as well. And obviously, a, a, a particular welcome to all our speakers. We've got a superb lineup today. Um, people have traveled. Um, uh, we've got an international, internationally renowned group of speakers today. And we're very, very grateful to, to them. There is one change in the program, and, or, or, or sort of an amendment to the program. Christian van der Werf uh, has had a terribly difficult time trying to get here from Amsterdam uh, due to cancelled planes and, and so forth and um, isn't able to be with us in person, but we're hoping we can set up a link and allow him to deliver his talk, to talk virtually. Bit of housekeeping, um, there will be a fire alarm test, uh, we think between 10.30 and 11. Uh, I'm told it's brief. Um, the phones, uh, you don't need educating on phones, and where, where, where we have panel discussions and people want to ask questions, that I think there will be roving microphones. So here we are at the Cavendish Conference Center. It sort of feels like our home ground. We have been here many times before. Um, we've got in the habit of alternating the, the conference between London and out of London on alternate years. And we've traveled around the country. Uh, to, we've been to Cardiff, Glasgow, Belfast, even Yorkshire. Um, and I'm delighted to to announce that next year's conference is going to be in Cambridge, and Greg Meller has kindly agreed to, to, uh, to host uh, and help organize that, that uh, conference next year. We don't have dates yet, but we'll, we'll release them as soon as we do. The, the, the annual conference is, a, is sort of the, the, the one dedicated event that brings us all together, the, the cardiologists, the geneticists, the counselors, the nurses, uh, the allied health professionals, and that's that's a unique opportunity for us all to network and communicate and, 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 and make friends. Um, but we do also have sessions, dedicated sessions uh, for the AICC at some of the other cardiology conferences, including Heart Rhythm Congress, which is held in October uh, in, in Birmingham, the British Cardiac Society uh, in June, usually May, May, June in Manchester, and from next year, the British Heart Rhythm Society is holding a symposia, uh, two, two or three days symposia. And um, this, we've been invited to deliver one of the sort of the, the, the key sessions on the main day, which is, which is a fantastic news. Um, and we're going to have a focused uh, discussion about Brugada syndrome and try and put the panelists under some pressure to answer some of those thorny issues that, that we struggle with with Brugada syndrome. So the AICC has been sort of going for about 15 years. I think it's really now finding its feet. Um, we're a professional body that brings together all the constituent parts, um, and we are truly representative, and I think we're sort of unique in that respect. It's a grassroots organization and, and democratic, and the only reason that I'm here, that, that um, Eleanor and Rachel and Jerry are representing the AICC is because we put ourselves forward to, to try and take this um, this field forward. We're going to have a lot of elections next year. 
Uh, we've got three new geneticist posts, uh, post for genetic counselor, an allied health professional post, and new training posts, um, and also a fetal cardiologist. So we're going to expand the, the council from 16 to 18. Um, and I think that'll give us better representation, greater influence, uh, and with more council members, I think we're able to achieve, achieve more. And I'd encourage all of you to really think about putting yourselves forward and, and, uh, and being elected onto AICC Council. So where are we in 2024? We've got Mavacampton, we've got a new drug, we've got a new service specification being drafted, we've got recent new guidelines on cardiomyopathies, and we've always had excellent first-class science in the UK. We've always been leading in that respect. But we, we can't be complacent. There are structural challenges that exist. Um, and we need to find solutions as a group so that we can deliver precision medicine. Um, we need to work out how we can follow up our ever-increasing cohorts of patients. And we need to um, you know, come to terms with and absorb the mainstreaming of genetic medicine. And I think we need to change our focus from the previous model of managing patients in small number of very specialist centers to assessing patients in high volume uh, without losing the quality of care that our patients deserve. And I just want to finish by thanking Rachel in particular, Rachel Bastianen, who's organized this, this conference and the training day yesterday. Um, it's an absolutely first class program. We've got an international panel of speakers, key opinion leaders, um, experts in their field. Uh, we've got three main sessions, culminating in the keynote lecture being delivered by Professor Arthur Wilder from AMS in Amsterdam. He's the leading voice in sodium channel disease in the world, and we're absolutely delighted that he's kindly agreed to join us. We also have sessions for posters um, and some clinical cases. And we've built in time for panel discussions, which will hopefully uh, stimulate some interesting debate and encourage you all to put questions to the panelists. Rachel, supported um, by Eleanor Wicks and Valerie Honore from the British Cardiac Society, have put in this extraordinary amount of work. Uh, the volume of email traffic has, has been quite something, um, and I've been protected from most of it. Um, and, and, and particular Eleanor and Valerie, who've done a lot of the, the sort of the behind the scenes, uh, sort of back office work ha has been tremendous. And they've cur curated and delivering a truly world-class conference and training day. And you just have to look at the, the speakers that we've got to understand that. So we've attracted a record number of delegates, which gives greater reach, greater influence, and I think a great platform for the future. So welcome to you all. Feel free to network, ask questions, make friends, and above all, enjoy the day. And we'll start our first session. So, the first session we're going to start with um, Professor Pelli Perry Elliott, who um, virtually needs no introduction. Perry's been uh, at the forefront of heart muscle research for, for many, many years. Uh, he's been my mentor and, and uh, research uh, supervisor, and uh, he's a professor of cardiology and cardiovascular medicine um, at, at Bart's Heart Center. Perry, you're going to talk to us about how to deliver an obstruction service. Maybe. <laughs> so thanks, Steve. Uh, and it's a great privilege to be here. And I think you've already referred to this, Steve, in your opening words. It's great to see a full room. I mean, as Steve said, the AICC has really moved on from its original uh, conception. Um, and it's, I think, like everything else in cardiomyopathy, it's at a tipping point where this becomes normal not isolated in a ghetto, talking to ourselves, but this is now part of mainstream cardiovascular medicine. And I suppose with, with that, <laughs> with those opening words, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask to talk about something we've been talking about since the 19th century, this problem of outflow tract obstruction in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
I always start with historical slides. But the problem about protracted destruction, as much as it pains me, was probably discovered by a Frenchman. <laughs> but he was described, clearly describing, using the stethoscope, out for protracted destruction. And the reason it was so wonderful for the 19th and indeed the 20th century cardiologist was because it's the paradigm for clinical examination. There are so many signs that you, that in outflow tract obstruction, which actually I still find quite useful because it tells you an enormous amount of, about physiology. But it was a, a relatively easy one to describe and to test students on. Outflow tract obstruction was also and always has been a source of fascination in terms of its pathophysiology. And indeed, there was a long-standing debate which raged from the 1960s up until the 1980s as to whether it was even outflow tract obstruction at all. Was it just simply an epiphenomenon of a small empty cavity? One of the pioneers behind determining its nature in obstruction was a guy called Doug Weidel in Canada, doing sort of classic pressure studies. Remember, this is 1966. So no floppy catheters. This was rigid catheters through the chest wall. So this was the, the age of heroes. Where it started to gather pace was when we started to be able to interrogate both the mechanism and the presence of obstruction using echocardiography. Uh, for those of you, again, of a certain age, this is what we call an M-mode echocardiogram. Um, but it shows, basically, what causes it. So you've got systolic anterior motion in the mitral valve, and if you look carefully here, you've got the pressure gradient. It relates directly to the timing of onset of systolic anterior motion on contact and its duration. And indeed, there is a formula called the Pollock formula, should you want to calculate the gradient from the M mode. But of course, we can do this using two-dimensional imaging. Here it is, this strange phenomenon. This is the um, atrium, ventricle, aorta. And if you look carefully, you've got elongation of the anterior leaflet and contact between that leaflet and the septum. Systole. I put this slide up because we're talking about pathways for the management of outflow tract obstruction, and I think there is, everybody says, oh, it's obstructed because of this thick septum, which is partly true, but the physiology is more complex than that, and the reason I want to emphasize this is because the, what you do to the patient to relieve obstruction depends on how well you understand the physiology of obstruction, because it varies from patient to patient. So yes, you have narrowing of the outflow tract. Yes, you have movement of the mitral valve. But remember, mitral valves don't do that. They're not allowed to move forwards because they're tethered by the submitral apparatus. So this is also a disease of the mitral valve. Misoriented, elongation, abnormal cordy, abnormal pillory muscles. And you have to understand that when you're assessing someone with obstruction so that you get the right treatment for the right patient. And again, this issue of the mitral valve. You know, if you've got elongation, if you've got accessory connections, then the treatment for that is not alcohol ablation. Final point I'll make about sort of the nature of this beast is that it is also, or can be, incredibly dynamic. So when you assess the patient at rest, you hear nothing, you see nothing. If you provoke the patient by, I don't know, talking about the Conservative government or something like that, then you can provoke a gradient. This is classic, what's called the Brockenbro phenomenon, so post-ectopic. But it's, this has to be part of the assessment of all symptomatic patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Because unless you do this, you're going to miss obstruction. OK, so th this talk, I suppose, is born out of the evolution of treatment of this phenomenon. And again, there's been a long and noble history of surgery. Probably the first guy to do it was Bill Cleland. Opened up the heart through the aorta, saw a thick bit, put a knife in it. <laughs> Very surgical approach to the problem. Um, that was taken on a little bit by putting a knife in and taking a piece out by Rus Russell Brock, Morrow, who sort of, I suppose, created a version of the modern operation. And very sadly died from the condition himself indirectly. Um, do you know who that is? 
for anybody less than about 50 or 60, that is Eugene Brown Ward. We were all young once. But remember, there, before drugs were, before um, 1950s, 60s, all we had was surgery, beta blockers, Eugene, diazepuramide, this is Doug Weigel, verapamil. This was sort of the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. We knew then that the drugs were often ineffective or patients got a lot of side effects. So we were hunting for something which wasn't quite surgery, so then we had septal alkyl ablation. Probably in this country, we recognize Ulrich Sigvart for his contribution, but again, anybody know who that is? No, Horst Kuhn, who did the same thing, and there's an argument about whether he did it first. And then dual chamber pacing. This was amongst the first randomized trials we ever did in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Dolbert, Rick Nishimura, Barry Maron. 1990s was all about what is the best way of treating this? What's the best way of doing septal reduction therapy? And we sort of got trapped, I think, for a while between the alcohol ablation guys, who can do anything, <laughs> and the surgeons, who will do anything. <laughs> um, that argument sort of tailed off a bit when we started to get meta-analyses showing there was no real difference between the two, but that, that isn't actually the right story, I don't think. These are not the same thing. Alcohol ablation creates an intramyocardial scar and probably works by inducing hypokinesis. You get a bit of thinning, but often not that much. Surgery, you chop a bit out and open up the outflow tract and you can also manipulate the mitral valve, but they're not the same. And not every patient is going to respond to either of these two things. So the thought process about management of outflow tract obstruction is complex. Which drugs, which interventions should the drugs fail depends on many things. Some of the patient-specific factors, some of them are whether you've got people who know how to do it. Now to try and sort of codify this, We've had a number of attempts at this. This was the 2014 attempt, 2014 ESC guidelines on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Big emphasis on you've got a symptomatic patient, exclude provocable obstruction by doing stressed echocardiography. Take away things that make obstruction worse, vasodilators. Um, <laughs> Hugh might remember this, but uh, we did have on here lose weight. Um, but because the average BMI of the committee was in excess of 30, we couldn't get consensus on that one. <laughs> Tiered approach to drug therapy. First line, beta blockers, contraindicated or ineffective rapamil. Second line, diazepuramide, also considered diuretics. So with a few little sort of clinical practice pearls, as it were. If you've got very high pulmonary systolic pressure, be very careful with rapamil. Diazepuramide, watch the QT, and the diuretics, be really careful you don't cause hypovolemia. And this one, this was a nudge. Again, a nudge to make people think it's, oh, I've seen a gradient, I'm going to do an alcohol ablation, or I've seen a gradient, I'm going to send the patient for surgery. You've got to individualize this. Are there other reasons for this person being breathless? Are they morbidly obese? Do they have asthma, etc.? What is the mechanism of obstruction? Is it just in the outflow or is there mid-cavity? Is there apical obliteration? Because all of that's going to influence the outcome from any procedure that you do. Looking at the mitral valve deliberately so you pick up any accessory abnormality which is not going to be fixed by septal reduction therapy and so on. And then on the left there, you know, why should this be any different to mitral valve surgery or indeed to you know, PCI? Should be multidisciplinary teams, and should be done by people who are trained in the procedures. And that last point is really important. We don't know in the UK still how many myectomies are being done, nor do we have data on the outcomes for a whole variety of reasons that we can discuss. In the US, what you get are the excellent data from Cleveland Mayo, but these are the data from outside Cleveland Mayo. Septal uh, surgery, overall mortality between 4 and 6%. Here in low volume centers, 
close to 16%. That's surgery. Look at alcohol relations. Low volume centers, more than 2%. Totally unacceptable. That's what you see if you don't have low volume in, oops, in experience centers. So latest iteration, chaired by Han Cassidy, you're gonna hear from shortly. In some respects, very little change. You got someone with symptoms, particularly if they're exertional, exclude alpha tract obstruction. Tiered approach to drugs, and then if the drugs don't work, experienced operators, severe symptoms, septal reduction therapy targeted to the anatomy. You might do it for other symptoms, for example, recurrent exertional syncope. And the same checklist with a little bit of adaptation. So in that sense, not much change, but I whizzed past this slide, didn't I? Because the reason I'm giving this talk is that, right? We've suddenly got a new, <laughs> we've got a new drug. Since Brownwald, we've got a new drug. So what is Mavacampton? Well, it's an example of a myosin modulator. Um, so this is sort of back to the beginning of our understanding of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Some mutations affect this critical component of sarcomeric function, the binding between beta myosin and actin filaments, which constitutes the so-called power stroke, which causes contraction. And some variants basically increase the probability of binding between the head and the actin filaments, which results in a hypercontractile phenotype and then a slightly mysterious pathway to hypertrophy. And it was reasoned that if you can reduce this binding in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can reduce this drive to hypertrophy. And heavens above, a randomized clinical controlled trial using the drug in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the Explorer trial, targeting patients with obstruction, so going for the, I hate the phrase, but low-hanging fruit, you know, negative inotropic effect. And what happens is you reduce the gradient, you improve exercise tolerance, you also reduce markers of cell stress, BMP, troponin. And this is why we're all running around saying we need a pathway, because it's not quite like doing a beta blocker, a disapyramide, or a rapamil, because that's what you have to do to up-titrate the drug. So the up-titration protocol is complex because it's such a potent negative inotrope. First of all, you've got to be careful about your patient selection. And then secondly, you've got to be sure that you're monitoring ejection fraction during up titration. This algorithm, and it's a slight modification um, for what's been approved in the UK, is designed to maximize efficacy and safety at the same time. One way of doing that is to measure plasma levels of the drug. This is a pragmatic approach saying that's unlikely to happen, so you up-titrate measuring ejection fraction and also the gradient. Now, we, you can see 12 weeks, echo, echo, echo. What's the waiting time for echo in your hospital? This is why we're talking about pathways, because it's an entirely new pathway for us. You've got to have echoes and clinical reviews each time you go up. And there's a few other things we have to think about. This is pinched from something provided by BMS to aid people through this. And I, I'm just going to draw your attention to this uh, in, sorry, information sheet, really. One of the things we have to think about this drug is liver metabolism. So it's ma metabolized in the liver through the cytochrome P450 system. So now as a, it's, it will be mandatory to check CYP2G variants. If you're a slow metabolizer, then you cap the dose. That's not unique to this pathway, though, because that's now the recommended approach to using clopidogrel, for example, in patients with stroke or undergoing PCI. So this is going to be mainstream within NHS practice eventually, probably within a year. Because it's metabolized by liver enzymes, you've got to think about interactions with other drugs that in alter liver enzyme activity, proton pump inhibitors. Because of this effect on the ejection fraction, you've got to monitor patients more regularly and more frequently than perhaps you might ordinarily. 
you've got to think about altered handling of the drug during the current illness. You've got to think about its effect on the fetus. So you've got to give a priori, you've got to give advice on contraception and what to do should women conceive. And very upfront in this guidance is if it's not working, stop it. But you know, when, when you think about this, we should be doing this already. This should be part of our pathway for every patient, whether we're giving them mavacamptan or diazepiramide or beta blockers or rapamil. And I think this whole exercise around mavacamptan for me is a way of us just sort of revisiting what we already do in clinical practice and sharpening it up a bit. You know, the nature of these diseases is they often affect younger women. So actually reproductive advice, the potential effects of drugs should be part of standard of care. I'm not sure we do that very well. Thinking about drug interactions more proactively is something that we should do routinely in the clinic. What happens when you're sick? So this, yes, is part of our emerging pathway for Mavacampton, but it should be what we do anyway. Now, this was a late night thing. I thought they want a pathway. So, okay, let's start writing a pathway. Pretty pathetic, isn't it, really? Um, but, you know, what do we do? Um, you've got to have a standardized approach to assessment of the disease, management, multidisciplinary approach, SOPs for what you're going to do, how you're going to follow the patients up. All of this should be underpinned by performance indicators, so you know what you want to do. Are you actually doing it with audit? As Steve has said, I think, in the uh, meeting this morning about data collection, research should be part of what we do if we want to continue to improve practice. And we should also have plans in place for training, succession planning, workforce, etc. Fortunately, the work's already been done. So one and, one and his colleagues on the guidelines committee have actually sort of set a whole series of standards for what the service looks like and also how we should be educating patients and healthcare practitioners. So my advice, go to the guidelines and adapt this. But this is about management of all cardiomyopathies, not just obstruction, because the principles apply whether you're obstructed or not. So, there's a pathway. Everything I've been saying is about the land of Oz, where I work. But of course, as Steve mentioned in his opening words, we sit within a sea of cardiomyopathies. So we see the tip of an iceberg. It's an increasingly large tip. <laughs> But we know there are a ton of people out there with cardiomyopathy that are not being referred in for evaluation. This is the London uh, network. We, we have a, a group which is responsible for the uh, operating global network for inherited disease in North London. These are the feeder hospitals. How does this pathway work in relation to this much broader population of people who might benefit from therapy? And we've got to start thinking about that. The, the current direction of travel is not sustainable. You know, this is the number of patients, and in fact this is an underestimate, I'm pretty sure, of number of referrals to uh, some of the hospitals in, in the network in North London, and this is having a massive effect on our waiting times. So we're up to four, over 40 weeks for a new patient now. That's just not acceptable. That's rubbish. So how do we deal with that? Well, we can look at novel ways of follow-up, patient um, initiated follow-up plans, etc., all that kind of stuff. But actually, I think we've got to learn from colleagues. The one thing we shouldn't do is try to reinvent the wheel. And there are systems out there that are designed to try and help us in this kind of approach. I think probably one of the closest analogies is adult congenital heart disease. And adult congenital heart disease recognizes that you have to have different levels, tiers, whatever, of expertise through which patients may proceed or be referred according to their need. So you need a limited number, I would say, of advanced therapy centers. Myectomy should not be done everywhere. I'm sorry, it should not be done everywhere. Perhaps alcohol ablation shouldn't be done everywhere. 
but we also need some intermediate centers. We need centers that see everybody and can perfectly adequately manage them without having to send them to a, a center. And also, this has to be mainstreamed. Cardiomyopathy is like heart failure. So you want local champions in district general hospitals who take care of the cardiomyopathy work. And this, I think, is the, is the only way in which we're going to move to the next level, where we provide the best care to the maximum number of patients. Back to history. I love this slide. This is before ECHO. This is chest X-ray, ECG, and a stethoscope. This is Paul Wood standing outside the old heart hospital, taken from one of his notes about a woman he's got with symptoms. And he says, I think I know what this is now, and we call it functional muscular subvalvular aortic stenosis. It's due to gross hypertrophy of the outflow tract of the left ventricle for reasons we still don't understand. The muscle gets so thick that it tends to obstruct itself and so cause the outflow tract murmur and thrill. 1958. We haven't moved a great deal since then, but we are <laughs> on, we've got things that we can do for this disease. The other thing, great thing about this slide is the next line, which says, perhaps, he says that he thinks she's got a, a poor prognosis, um, although he didn't actually tell her about that. But she actually outlived him for about 30 years. <laughs> and the reason for that, if you see, if those of you are into pre pre prevention, <laughs> things were a little different in the 1950s. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Perry. Um, just before we move on to Stephen's talk, um, there are seats, guys, if you want to come and sit down. They're good ones as well, they're right at the front. So just while everybody's getting comfortable, um, so I'll introduce our AICC president, uh, lead for the inherited service in the, in the better part of Yorkshire, um, and very much the driving force behind the national survey, which he's going to update us about. So Dr. Stephen Page. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, so here we all are, 2023 annual conference, um, we've taken time out of our busy schedules to come and meet and share ideas and it gives us an opportunity to sort of pause and reflect and, and assess where we are as an ICC community. And in, and in many respects, we're in a, in a very, very exciting position. There have been a number of new initiatives recently. We've got the ICC is growing and growing. ICC as a specialty is growing and growing. Um, we've got record numbers of delegates and attendees here today. We've been living through this extraordinary change in, in genomic medicine, this genomic era. And we've, we've, over the last few years, we've seen genomic medicine become integrated into clinical practice in a way that um, I, I think is probably unique within the world. And we've got the reconfiguration of the genetic testing labs. We've got the National Testing Directory. And we can, we've standardized genetic testing. So we've got this incredibly powerful resource. We've also got a new drug. And this, as Perry's just been telling us, the very exciting potential for being able to treat the, the, the cause of the condition rather than just the symptoms. And Professor Watkins is going to speak on this later but the, the, the potential for really exciting therapy, gene therapy, um, to treat the patients that we have is, is very, very exciting. But as I take over as AICC president, it would, it would not be unreasonable for my peers or my colleagues or commissioners or politicians or NHS leaders to put some questions to me and say, well, look, you know, you've got these You've got genetic testing. You've got um, you've got uh, you've got the, your new drug. You've got gene therapy potentially on the horizon. So so tell us, Dr. Page, how many patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have got symptomatic obstruction in the UK? Hmm. Um, 
pass. Okay, we'll, we'll keep it a bit simpler then. Just, t just tell us how many patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are there in the UK? Uh, pass. Okay, then how many patients are seen in ICC clinics in the UK? You, you must know that. Ooh, uh, pass. Right, really simple. How many ICC centres are there in the UK? Ah, I, I know that one because we did a national survey. We did it two years ago and uh, the answer is 31. Uh, that's not correct, Dr. Page, uh, because there are new services have developed since then, so, so I'm afraid you're out of date. So, <laughs> not, not very impressive performance. And this highlights a problem. Um, we've got all these great opportunities, all these great technologies. This, um, the science is, is far outstripping our ability to have some, some simple... Uh, data collection. We've got this great big gap in, in our ability to process and collect data. So why do we need data? Why is that important? Well, we need the data to be able to drive service development. If we're to understand how, what services are required, how many cardiologists, how many geneticists, how many nurses we need, we need to know how many patients we're dealing with. If we're expecting investment from commissioners and the NHS, we need to be able to demonstrate that with data. We want to be able to identify gaps in service provision, the patches of the country which have under provision in terms of ICC service. Data is really in important to ensure quality and that our ability to measure outcomes and demonstrate that the work that we do is actually effective and safe and of high quality. We, we know that we've got you know, problems with obstructive HCM and the drug companies have you know, latched onto that and, and, and we, we have a new drug. But if we're to ask the right research questions, we need to understand the data, what the, what the clinical problems are, and we need to be able to therefore count and assess. And if we expect further drugs in class, you know, we've got Mavacampton, but if, we, if we're wanting industry to put in the, the billions of pounds in drug development, we need to be able to demonstrate what those clinical problems are. And of course, the, the commissioners are paying us to do this, this work, and, and, and they quite rightly would expect us to be able to demonstrate what we're doing and whether we're doing it effectively. So there are, of course, um, existing processes for data collection. And within cardiology, we've been doing this for, for many years now. Um, the NICOR clinical um, audit programs have been established for some time, and they continue to develop, with heart failure being the most sort of recent addition to that. Um, and for those of us who work in the cath lab, contributing to the NICOR data set is just part of what we do. It's just an expected process at the end of a case that you, you spend a few minutes um, inputting data into, a, into a, a database that gets submitted to, to, uh, to a national uh, data collection. Um, heart failure is a bit different because, of course, it's an, a largely outpatient-based specialty, um, but they've, they've introduced data collection for inpatient uh, admissions. But if you know, a structural interventional cardiologist can tell me how many TAVIs they do and what their complication rates are and what type of valves they use and, and, and clinically important data, I think we, 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 we need to recognize that we're not, we're not able to match that. And there's this big gap, and ICC, I think, is an outlier. And I think we need to reflect on that. Now, there are a number of different ways in which we could collect data. The NICOR data set is, is, is one such mechanism. It could be through the NHS. It could be through central NHS-funded data collection streams. It could be academia. The charities may well have a role to play. And I think we need to try and work out what, what is the role of the ICC in this. You know, we are a small, relatively low-funded organisation but we, do, we are the professional voice for our 
for our um, for, for the ICC community, and, and and I think we need to establish what our what that role is. Now, attempts have been made in the past to to try and get a national data set, and you know this has been something that's been discussed for many years. But we haven't achieved it. We haven't actually got to the point where data starts to get collected, and there are a number of reasons why this might be. ICC services in this country have, have traditionally been driven by uh, uh, academic centres. Um, and academics are interested in research and they have a, a perspective on what, what data they see as, as valuable. Clinicians may have a different perspective and are often more interested in service delivery and service development, so a different set of parameters, although there may be overlap. Healthcare devolution hasn't helped because we are fragmented in that sense, and um, although NHS England uh, you know, may be able to incorporate um, uh, data into the service specification, that, that only applies to England. The NHS England is, or the NHS in general, is interested in um, uh, dashboards and they have their own particular number of parameters that they may be interested in collecting. Funding is o o always a perennial problem and the lack of funding has, has limited uh, uh, establishing data collection nationally and actually when you when you stop and think well what data do we want to collect it's actually a lot harder than you think. Now we have had um, discussions for many years, but particularly recently with the, with the surface specification uh, writing group, and we've started to talk about the different types of data. There is not consensus, and these are my sort of, this is my perspective rather than, than, a, than a consensus view. But it gives you an example of, of several of the different groups of data that you may or we, we ought to be collecting. The first is sort of national overview data. So this is looking at how many ICC centres are there, how are they designed, do they include a hub-and-spoke approach, do they involve a network? What's their catchment area? Are they big, are they small? And how do we contact them? How do we put ICC centres in communication with each other? You've got provider-level data, so this is where an ICC provider, an NHS trust, can describe new patient activity. How many patients are we seeing? What's, what sort of follow-up cohort? And, and when we did the national survey two years ago and asked the question about activity, the, the, the responses were pretty woeful. Some trusts couldn't answer it at all. Um, a lot of trusts would round it up to the nearest hundred. But the ability to actually precisely describe how many patients have been seen, how many new patients have been seen in an ICC centre is actually a lot harder to, to uh, d define as, as you might think. We would certainly want to, to look at the volume of genetic testing, a GLH activity. Um, we want to look at procedure numbers. Perry's already alluded to the fact we don't know how many myectomies are being performed. And seeing that we spend a lot of our time in MDTs, we'd want to capture an MDT activity in some form. You've got patient level data. So this is where you're looking at an individual patient. You'd want to know the diagnosis, maybe the treatment they've received, maybe something about comorbidities, um, risk assessment and complications. Outcome metrics is a really important uh, uh, measure in terms of the NHS. And, but a very thorny issue and very hard to define for an outpatient-based specialty. Uh, in procedural-based specialties, much easier. You can look at complication rates uh, and, and procedural success and outcomes, but in, in an outpatient-based specialty, much harder to define. Proposals have included the time to assessment for a new patient and the proportion of index cases being offered genetic testing. And then PPI. Feedback from the patient. You know, what, what are the patient priorities and, and what, do they, what do they value? 
And I think one reason why, why we may have been limited in our ability to start collecting data is that we've tried, we've tried to sort of pool it all into one. And we've, and we've tried to start off with a fully, fully working system. I think what we need to do is just start collecting data and, and, and grow it and build on it and try and grow it organically. And it may be that we need to collect data in different ways. The AICC, I think, has a role in collecting data relating to sort of the national oversight of ICC services. Provider-level data could, could, and I hope, will be incorporated into the national service specification, at least in England, where trusts are obliged to be able to provide data on activity. Patient-level data, much harder. Um, maybe that's the role for academia. We heard yesterday um, from Kate Thompson describing the MRC ICC node, um, and I think it was project two of that was, was looking at sort of genotype, phenotype correlations and, and trying to collect uh, large cohorts of, of, of phenotyped and genotype patients nationally, and maybe there's a role there. Outcome metrics is, is something that's required in NHS England uh, service specification. And PPI, the, the, the charities are very well placed to, to provide this. Um, Cardiff Office of the UK um, uh, undertakes patient surveys. There's, there's one being launched again next year. So, so there's, 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 we don't need to necessarily collect all the data in the same way. Now, we did a national survey two years ago. Um, we did this by forming a working group, initially from AICC council members, but we wanted to include representatives from the devolved nations. We identified lead clinicians, and, and this was a, essentially a bit of paper and a pen and, and trying to work out from, from scratch uh, the lead clinicians from known ICC centres across the UK, often by reputation or local knowledge. We then sent a survey, it included four domains, looking at service, uh, service structure, staffing, contacts and activity, and the responses were collated and summarised into the di Directory of Services. Now, this is deliberately out of date, so don't feel hard done by if your centre isn't on the, on, on, the, uh, uh, on the map, and this does require me to manually place the, uh, the tail on the donkey of where these cities are, so <laughs> forgive me if, I've, if I've, my geography has let me down. Um, but we learnt that there are 31 centres in the UK at that stage, four in Scotland, one in Northern Ireland, um, one pan Wales service split across sites, and 25 centres in England, including six in London. 20 of these centres provided paediatric services, and six centres self-identified as a national referral centre. We learnt that there's a, there's a very wide range of catchment areas, from less than half a million to six million, are the biggest, but most centres are seeing or, or providing services for more than uh, one million uh, individuals in the population. One, I think, really uh, sort of heartwarming finding was that all 31 ICC centres provide the full range of ICC services. Um, so I, I, think, I think that was a very positive thing that came out of it. And we also learned that FH, which has at various times been included in the list of ICCs, uh, I think it, it is clear that almost all centres manage those patients separately. Perry's already alluded to this, but a surprising number of centres are performing myectomy, septal ablation, and sympathectomy. These data were incorporated into this directory of services, and um, this is on the website, and you can look and search for centres, and this will list um, the individuals, the clinicians who are working there, um, the contact details and referral pathways. It includes links to websites, telephone numbers, email addresses. And I, th I think people have found this a very useful resource. It, it allows us to communicate much more easily and be able to cross-refer patients, particularly for family screening, when we know who to refer to. 
So that, this was two years ago that we did the national survey. We're going to repeat this in, the, in, in 2024. We talked at the AGM about establishing a permanent AICC national survey and data committee so that this will, they will have uh, a rolling group of individuals responsible for looking at this and delivering it. We're looking to design and deliver the second national survey in the spring. We want to combine it because we've done a lot of the work already and we know the vast majority of the centres and we will be working to update the, the, the contact information. And I think that gives an opportunity to, to tag on a clinical audit. And I think that the clinical audit that is, is probably the most topical is, is family screening and how we do it. I think we're all aware that there's a big range in approaches, but I think having proper data to measure that and assess it will be helpful to, to, to guide how we uh, guide recommendations. And I think we do need to work towards a secure funding stream to support the work. So that's just one element of where I think the AICC has, has a role. I think that we need to ensure that contributing to national data collection is a contractual obligation of service providers. This is the, the role of the service specification. Those discussions are ongoing. Um, we have lobbied hard to make sure that this is included. Um, but it's, it, it, I, think, I think what has been lacking is the detail. Um, but I think if we can get, get that in, in the contractual obligation between uh, providers and commissioners, I think that'll be a big step forward. I think that just applies to England, of course. So I think we need to work uh, with the devolved nations to try and standardize data collection. We will lead the design, introduction, and maintenance of data collection. And we will look to deliver the annual evaluation of services with the national survey, which will provide a platform for information sharing and audit. And I think particularly important is the need to drive cultural change within the ICC community to see this as an absolutely fundamental priority. And I think it's going to be hard for us to deliver the scientific progresses that we've seen unless we can get our house in order in terms of data, to, data collection. Thank you very much. Again, just before we introduce the next speaker, there are seats towards the front for those guys standing at the top of the stairs. Do, do come and sit. So I, I've got great pleasure in, in welcoming our next speaker, Professor Fran Kasky, um, a friend and colleague of, of many years. Um, Fran works at Great Ormond Street Hospital, where he's a professor of paediatric inherited uh, cardiac disease, um, and is one of the the, the sort of the, the, the key opinion leaders in in heart muscle uh, disease in Europe, and uh, has been um, chairing and co-chairing the the development of the recent guidelines. Um, so thank you, Juan. You're going to talk to us about those guidelines. Oh, thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks, thanks to, to you, Stephen, and Rachel and Eleanor for, for organizing the conference. And as, as Perry said earlier, it's, it's really wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues in the same room. Um, it's, been, it's been a while, actually, since we've had a conference like this, so it's, it's great to be here. Um, and, and both you, Stephen, and Perry sort of alluded to the fact that cardiomyopathies specifically, but actually ICCs in general, are now moving away from being a niche sort of subspecialty and, and coming into the mainstream. And I think the fact that we now have the first dedicated ESC, international guidelines, for the whole range of cardiomyopathies is, is, is a reflection of that. And I think this really helps to move cardiomyopathies uh, into the mainstream. So I was very honored to, um, to, to chair uh, these guidelines with my colleague, Elena Arbella from, from Barcelona. Um, and, and with a really fantastic group of, of members in, in the task force, some of you who are in, in the room today. I, I don't have time to go through all of the 158 plus recommendations uh, in, in the guideline and, and you know, bear in mind that many of these recommendations are entirely new because we've never had a guideline for all of the cardiomyopathies uh, up until now. Um, but just to give you a brief 
sort of overview of how the guideline is structured. So we have really three sections. There's an introductory sort of general section uh, describing the general principles of assessment and general management of cardiomyopathies. There's a second section looking at recommendations for specific cardiomyopathy phenotypes. Uh, and then there's a section at the end that sort of goes through, again, more generic uh, recommendations outside of the uh, sort of standard medical management, um, again, across all the different cardiomyopathy phenotypes. And I'll just try and highlight what I think are some of the key features um, within each of these sections. The, the way the guideline is designed, and, and I guess a, a central tenet of the guideline, is this concept of a patient pathway. So really starting from the point at which a patient is referred and the cardiomyopathy is suspected and then diagnosed, through the diagnosis of the cardiomyopathy itself, the cardiomyopathy phenotype itself, and then leading towards a more etiological diagnosis, general management, and phenotype-specific management recommendations. And this sort of patient pathway, this diagnostic workflow, sort of runs as a thread through the entire guideline. In terms of the diagnosis of cardiomyopathies itself, we had long, long, long discussions about how best to classify cardiomyopathies within, within the task force. But ultimately, we felt that this approach, that sort of retaining a phenotype-based approach to diagnosis, and based on the cardiac phenotype that is the predominant phenotype at the point at which the diagnosis is made, at the point at which the patient presents, is probably the most sensible approach for clinicians. And so for this, we, we essentially define the cardiomyopathies according to morphological and functional traits. Some of these we'll be very familiar with, so ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular dilatation, systolic, diastolic dysfunction. But crucially, for the first time, we also now include the presence of non-ischemic ventricular scar fibrofatty replacement as a key morphological trait in the diagnosis of cardiomyopathies. And so we use these traits to describe the phenotypes, and we end up with five distinct phenotypes. So there's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, but also now this new kid on the block of non-dilated left ventricular cardiomyopathy. And this is the phenotype that is characterized by the presence of scar and other uh, abnormal myocardial tissue characterization on, on cardiac MRI. Now, the reason we've done that is because we all recognize that there are patients who clearly have a cardiomyopathic phenotype, but don't really fit neatly within what we used to have as our, as our diagnostic boxes. And the identification of this scar pattern is this is what happens with non-dilated. <laughs> we expected that reaction to the new non-dilated phenotype. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the identification of this phenotype of, of, of scar should really trigger a search for uh, a more specific underlying diagnosis. And that in many cases will be, will be genetic, and there are certain genotypes that are classically associated with this particular type of scar pattern on cardiac MRI, but it may also be non-genetic, so you might have a myocarditis, sarcoidosis as a cause of this non-dilated phenotype. And, and importantly, none of these phenotypes are diagnoses in their own right. It's the start of a diagnostic pathway. You identify the phenotype, and you then move on to define a much more specific etiological diagnosis. And in many cases, that will be a molecular diagnosis. And so in the guideline, we have a, a, an example of how this works in, in, in real life. This is a, a, a male with a family history of sudden cardiac death. So it's already something that makes you think, could this patient have a cardiomyopathic sort of phenotype? The phenotype in the patient is, an, is of, non -left, is, is of a, a, a normal left ventricle, so non-dilated with low normal ejection fraction, but subepicardial scar. There are some ventricular ectopics, but no overt arrhythmia in this case. And this patient has a disease-causing variant in desmoplakin. So in the past, this patient might have been classified as having dilated cardiomyopathy, but actually there is no left ventricular dilatation. Might have been described as having left-dominant arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, ALVC, 
arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy more generally, but actually arrhythmia was not a key component of this patient's presentation. And so by moving from a sort of a simplistic approach, trying to put it into a particular box where it doesn't really fit, and using the phenotype, not just the cardiac phenotype, but the associated features, we end up with a much more narrative description of what this patient has. So we can now say this patient has orthomal dominant desmoplakin related non-dilated LB cardiomyopathy with subepicardial scar, low normal ejection fraction, family history of sudden cardiac death, et cetera. And so this is a much more precise way of, of identifying the phenotype and the etiology in these patients. And, and that really forms part of this diagnostic workflow for all cardiomyopathy patients. So we start with clinical scenarios that are a really very common clinical presentation. So a patient may present with, with symptoms that are often nonspecific. It may be as a result of an incidental finding. It may be as a result of family screening. But the key thing here is to have this cardiomyopathy mindset that the, the late Claudio Rapetzi was, was key in, in, in proposing and interpreting those clinical presentations, the results of clinical investigations, with that thought process, could this patient have a cardiomyopathy? So we look at the, at the myocardial phenotype, but we also look at associated phenotypic traits. So the presence of arrhythmia, for example, a key associated trait in this context. Genetic testing, the family history, pathology results. And we put that all together to end up with a much more precise etiological diagnosis that integrates all of those phenotypes, the cardiac phenotype and the extra cardiac phenotype. And so in the guidelines, we have recommendations, class one recommendations, um, that all patients with uh, confirmed or a suspected cardiomyopathy should be evaluated using this multi-parametric approach that includes assessment of all of these cardiac and non-cardiac phenotypic traits. We mentioned before that it's very important that these patients with cardiomyopathies are seen within specialist services, and there is a class one recommendation for that as well. So all patients with a cardiomyopathy and their relatives should have access to multidisciplinary teams with expertise in the diagnosis and management of cardiomyopathies. But we also highlight the importance of a shared approach with more local services, so general cardiology, pediatric cardiology. And this alludes to that concept that Perry was talking about before with adult congenital heart disease of, of perhaps different tiers in the management of these patients. Multimodality imaging is, is crucial to the diagnosis of cardiomyopathy. It's how we identify that cardiomyopathy phenotype. And there are, of course, in the guideline recommendations on the use of echocardiography and many other imaging modalities, but I want to focus specifically on cardiac MRI because this is new. So we now have a class one recommendation that cardiac MRI is recommended in all patients with cardiomyopathy at initial evaluation, and a 2A recommendation that cardiac MRI should be considered during follow-up in patients with cardiomyopathy to monitor disease progression and to aid in management and, and risk stratification decisions. But it's not just the probands. Cardiac MRI is also extremely important for screening for the relatives. So there's a 2A recommendation that in families with cardiomyopathies in which there is a disease-causing variant identified, MRI should also be considered as part of the screening process in these patients. And it may also be considered as a 2B indication in families with cardiomyopathies, even if there isn't an identified genotype in the family. So if there's familial disease, MRI is extremely important in the assessment. And it's not just for, for diagnosis, but it's also for prognostic purposes and treatment uh, monitoring. And we have sort of examples in, in the guideline of some of the red flags that we might pick up on <coughs> cardiac MRI that may point towards more specific etiological diagnoses. And these are sort of based uh, and divided into uh, the different cardiomyopathy phenotypes. So imaging is extremely important, but so is genetic testing. There are long sections actually in the guideline dealing with the genetic architecture of cardiomyopathies, recognizing that in many cases these will be monogenic with variable penetrance and complete penetrance variable expression, but that there is also a body of evidence suggesting that polygenic inheritance may be important in a proportion of these uh, patients with cardiomyopathy or families with cardiomyopathies. And we have lots and lots of tables depicting 
genes that are relevant for different cardiomyopathy phenotypes, giving an idea of the strength of evidence for each of those genes. And uh, I'm not going to go through these at, at, at all, but there, there are very large tables. And of course, these will sort of quite quickly become up, out of date as our knowledge of the genetic basis of the cardiomyopathies continues to improve. But genetic testing is key in the assessment of cardiomyopathies, and that's reflected in the guidelines too. So there's a central role for genetic testing for the probant, for the patient with a cardiomyopathy, in terms of making an etiological diagnosis. Increasingly, in some subtypes of cardiomyopathy, genetic testing has important prognostic implications, as we'll see. There are treatment implications that can be gleaned from genetic testing, and of course, genetics is important for providing reproductive advice for the patients. But as before, and as, as we all know, genetic testing has a crucial role to play in the management of relatives of individuals with cardiomyopathy. So the identification of a disease-causing variant in a proband with cardiomyopathy allows cascade screening predictive genetic testing to be performed in relatives, and those that don't carry the variant can generally be discharged from clinical care. And that's reflected in, in this algorithm, which essentially describes that process, so identifying a genetic variant, allows predictive testing, individuals who don't have the variant can be discharged, those that do remain under clinical follow-up. And, and there are recommendations also here for how to deal with variants of uncertain significance within families. Genetic testing is accompanied by genetic counseling, and, we, and, and we, we're really keen to highlight this in our recommendations. We have a number of recommendations on the importance of genetic counseling, including a class one recommendation that counseling should be delivered by trained professionals, not necessarily genetic counselors, but professionals trained in genetic counseling, but also that genetic counseling should be offered even if families are not considering genetic testing. So it goes beyond pre and post test counseling. That's clearly an important role of counseling. But genetic counseling is essential in the assessment of all patients with cardiomyopathies, whether genetic testing is being considered or not. For genetic testing, we have a class one recommendation that testing is recommended in all patients who fulfill diagnostic criteria for cardiomyopathy, including post-mortem genetic testing for individuals where the initial presentation is a sudden cardiac death. For families, there's a class one recommendation that predictive genetic testing should be offered to all adult first degree relatives of an individual with a cardiomyopathy, as long as you've identified a bona fide disease-causing variant in the family. But importantly, a new recommendation that predictive genetic testing should also be considered in children, in pediatric first-degree relatives, regardless of their age. And this is a new recommendation. Of course, this needs to be done in the context of appropriate genetic counseling, and there are many issues to be considered, particularly when thinking about counseling children for predictive genetic testing, and these are highlighted in the table in the, in the, in the guideline, but also in this, in this figure here. And we also, I think for the first time in a sort of an international guideline like this, include recommendations specifically for providing psychological support for patients and families with cardiomyopathy. And these, this, this, I think, is also really important and, and a, a novel set of recommendations in this guideline. The rest of this section sort of deals with general principles of assessment of symptoms, management of heart failure, atrial ventricular arrhythmias, et cetera, and general recommendations on, on device uh, implantation, as well as follow-up of patients with cardiomyopathy and their relatives. But I'm going to move on now to the second section of the guideline, which deals with phenotype-specific management recommendations. And again, just highlighting things that I think are novel uh, and, uh, and, and new, certainly compared to the old hypertrophic cardiomyopathy guidelines. So for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, of course, we had the excellent 2014 guidelines. And so for this particular uh, 2023 iteration, we've essentially provided a focused update on the 2014 guidelines. And Perry's already shown some of this, but essentially, many of the recommendations for assessment and management of symptoms for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are largely unchanged from, from 2014. Some nuances, but largely unchanged. But where, where there are novel findings, and we've already seen this in, in Perry's talk, is in the recommendations for the medical treatment of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So here we have these two new 
recommendations related to the use of myosin inhibitors, so mavacantin. So there's a 2A recommendation that mavacantin should be considered in addition to beta blockers or calcium channel blockers in symptomatic adult patients with LV outflow tract obstruction. And it should also be considered as monotherapy in adult symptomatic obstructive patients who are unable to take beta blockers or calcium channel blockers or disapyramide or who have contraindications to them. And we've already seen this uh, algorithm that just details the place of mavacantin within that treatment um, strategy. So we still have beta blockers, calcium channel blockers as first line class one indications, but there's now the option of mavacantin as a second line of treatments with all of the uh, 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 monitoring that, that Perry highlighted in his talk. And then of course for patients who remain symptomatic despite this, there's still a class one indication for septal reduction therapies. And most of the recommendations for septal reduction therapy, again, are, are very similar uh, to, to those from 2014, just to highlight a couple of, of specific uh, changes or nuances. So first of all, the septal myectomy specifically, rather than alcohol septal ablation, is recommended in children with an indication for septal myectomy. There are no data really on alcohol septal ablation in, in children. And a more nuanced recommendation here that septal reduction therapy in expert centers may be considered even with milder symptoms, so functional class two symptoms, refractory to medical therapy, as long as there is also evidence of moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, atrial fibrillation, or left atrial dilatation. Prevention of sudden cardiac death remains a key aspect of the management of the cardiomyopathy. So again, this is highlighted uh, in, in the guidelines. So we have specific recommendations for ICD implantation across all cardiomyopathy phenotypes. And here I just want to highlight the uh, recommendation to use quantitative validated risk prediction models where these are available, again, across the cardiomyopathy phenotypes. And I'll show you some examples of this. So for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy specifically, for primary prevention, we retain class one indication to use the Hogan Risk SCD calculator as the method of estimating sudden cardiac death risk in adult patients. But there's a new recommendation now that validated pediatric specific risk models, such as the Hogan Risk Kids model, is, is recommended again as a class one indication to estimate sudden death risk over five years in children, so individuals under the age of 16. And this is both at baseline and also during follow-up. There are, within the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotype, a number of new recommendations for primary prevention, just to highlight. There we go. So in patients with left ventricular apical aneurysms, we have a 2A recommendation that risk assessment should not be based solely on the presence of the aneurysm, but should actually take into account the personalized, individualized risk estimate that you obtain using Hogan Risk SCD, Hogan Risk Kids. And for patients with a low estimated five-year risk, so those with a risk of less than 4% at five years, there are two new recommendations, both 2B, that the presence of extensive late GAD on cardiac MRI or the presence of systolic dysfunction may be considered as additional tools to guide risk stratification, but recognizing that we really have very little in the way of robust evidence to tell us whether the addition of these parameters actually improves our risk assessment over and above what we get from the uh, uh, individualized risk uh, prediction models. So this is um, the new algorithm. So for primary prevention, those individuals with a five-year risk of more than 6% continue to have a 2A indication for ICD implantation. Those with an intermediate risk score between 4 and 6% have a 2B indication. And then those with a low risk score who also have one of these additional risk factors may also have uh, an ICD indication as a 2B recommendation. But importantly, these recommendations need to be part of a shared decision-making process. And again, this is highlighted specifically in the guideline. We are really, really very keen to acknowledge that there are significant challenges associated with, first of all, defining universal thresholds across different cardiomyopathy phenotypes but also really to acknowledge that this shared decision-making process that we always talk about really needs to be based on real-world data. 
and that it needs to acknowledge gaps in evidence, that we need to share these with patients, and that we also need to think about competing risks, so not just disease-related risks, but also the risks of the treatments that we're proposing. And we really wanted to call for patient decision aids to help us communicate that risk to patients and families in a better way than we currently do. Uh, but this is again highlighted in, in specific recommendations, class one recommendations around shared decision making for ICD implantation. And of course, this isn't just for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it, it applies across the cardiomyopathy phenotypes, and probably the subtype in which this is most relevant is dilated cardiomyopathy. So here we wanted to, to move away from this concept of left ventricular ejection fraction as the, as the sole arbiter of risk in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy and highlight the importance of genotype in risk stratification. So that's a 2A recommendation, that genotype needs to be considered when assessing sudden cardiac death risk in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. So in patients with DCM who have an ejection fraction of more than 35%, but have a high-risk genotype and additional clinical risk factors, that's a 2A recommendation for ICD implantation. Even in the absence of additional risk factors, patients with DCM, an ejection fraction of more than 35% and a high-risk genotype, have a 2B recommendation for ICD implantation, so ICD may be considered. And it may also be considered in individuals with additional clinical risk factors, even in the absence of a high-risk genotype. So this is the, the new algorithm for DCM with that sort of gene-specific risk assessment at the very center of it. And we, and we have a table in the guideline that details some of those high-risk genotypes together with the associated clinical features that we think are markers of increased risk. And here the importance of late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI, as well as specific quantitative risk scores for certain genotypes such as uh, lamin ASD. Now, recognizing that there are many patients with variants in these genes who have an increased risk of sudden cardiac death but don't necessarily have evidence of left ventricular dilatation as part of their phenotype. That was one of the drivers for the development of this uh, new phenotype of non-dilated LV cardiomyopathy. And so the, the recommendations for ICD implantation in non-dilated LV cardiomyopathy essentially mirror those of dilated cardiomyopathy but with necessarily lower uh, levels of evidence. Now, very briefly in the last few minutes, for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, we have new recommendations on the management of ventricular arrhythmias, both pharmacological uh, and catheter-based. We also have new recommendations for risk stratification, so for primary prevention. There's a 2A indication to use the updated 2019 ARBC risk calculator as part of that shared decision-making proce process, uh, but also considering additional high-risk features, um, such as the presence of non-sustained VT, reduced RV ejection fraction, et cetera. For restrictive cardiomyopathy, again, we have brand new recommendations on the assessment uh, and management of patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy. But what I want to highlight is this figure, which recognizes the fact that pure restrictive cardiomyopathy is actually a very rare condition. And a lot of the time we think about or we describe restrictive cardiomyopathy as in patients who actually have uh, restrictive physiology, but often in the context of, for example, left ventricular hypertrophy. And it's important to distinguish those groups because the natural histories are different, but also the recommendations for treatment will be different. Uh, we also have guidance on uh, assessment and management of syndromic and metabolic uh, cardiomyopathies as a separate section, uh, including separate sections on anderson fabry disease and cardiac amyloidosis. Um, and we have rec recommendations for, for exercise in patients with cardiomyopathy. And again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to highlight the first two, these are two new recommendations, both class one recommendations. The first, the regular Low to moderate intensity exercise is recommended in all individuals with cardiomyopathy who are able to do so. But also that an individualized risk assessment for exercise prescription should be performed in all patients with cardiomyopathy. And then there are more nuanced recommendations for specific cardiomyopathy phenotypes, including some related to, to gene carriers, so pre-phenotypic gene carriers. And then finally, we, we have additional recommendations that I won't go through uh, related to reproductive issues in patients with cardiomyopathies, management of non-cardiac surgery in patients with cardiomyopathies, assessment and management of other cardiovascular risk factors in these patients, um, and, and a table with guidance for daily activities for patients and, and for carers as well. 
So I think just, just to finish off, if I had to sort of pick the five key messages um, from the new guidelines, I'd say, first of all, this concept of a, of a diagnostic workflow that leads to a more specific, so it's a phenotype-based but etiological-driven management recommendations. I think the introduction of quantitative risk scores, particularly for dilated and non-dilated obvious cardiomyopathies. Highlighting the importance of cardiac MRI, both for diagnosis, but also as a tool for screening. Similarly, highlighting the importance of genetic testing with a role not just for diagnosis, but also in some cases with prognostic implications and particularly this concept of extending the uh, genet predictive genetic testing to childhood. And then much more specifically, and we've already heard about this already, the changes that, and, and the really sort of exciting advances that we're seeing in terms of management of, of symptomatic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction with the advent of myosin inhibitors um, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and I think this is all highlighted in the central illustration which that sort of goes through the patient pathway from diagnosis, from presentation, all the way through to phenotype specific management. So thanks very much. Thank you, Juan. And to conclude what's been a fantastic um, first session, um, we have Antonio de Marveo, who is a senior clinical lecturer at King's College um, and also a consultant in the ICC and maternal cardiology, and is a rare breed in that he is dual accredited as an obstetric physician as well. He's going to talk about uh, inherited risk assessment in pregnancy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you to AICC for, for inviting me and for giving center stage to something I'm very passionate about, which is the care of uh, women with cardiac disease during pregnancy. It's a huge topic. Um, can't really cover every single uh, ICC condition and every single stage of pregnancy, each scenario. But I would try to achieve today uh, to, to get an overview of the outcomes of cardiac disease in pregnancy in the UK discuss the new legal uh, framework of pre-pregnancy care, uh, mainly the new maternal medicine networks who are just um, getting off the ground. We'll talk about the principles of pre-pregnancy counseling, uh, and in the end, a quick snapshot of uh, several ICCs, or the more common ICCs in, in pregnancy. So no talk on uh, cardiovascular disease in pregnancy could, could start without some slides on embrace. Um, so that's the, the uh, audit and confidential inquiry into maternal mortality in the UK and Ireland. Uh, and as it's been the case for the last uh, two or three decades, cardiovascular disease remains as the main cause of maternal mortality, either during pregnancy in up to a year after delivery. Uh, for the first time, the exception uh, was that COVID um, had similar numbers of, of mortality in the last triennium. Um, and you can see in this, the, the, the graph on the left, we've really not made many uh, great inroads in um, reducing maternal mortality in the UK in the past couple of decades. So there's this new national safety ambition to reduce stillbirths, neonatal and maternal deaths by 50% by 2030. We're more or less halfway through the um, time or the lead time to achieve that, uh, and we haven't. So mortality in pregnancy from cardiovascular disease, if you break that down, uh, about 50 to 60% could be potentially consistent with um, uh, inherited cardiac conditions. So we have aortic dissections, we have sudden arrhythmic death, and uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, but as you all know, mortality really is the, the tip of the iceberg. So these are um, otherwise young uh, women with few comorbidities. And if you have about a mortality of about 240 women um, uh, each three years, that is the tip of a much larger iceberg of morbidity, mortality, ill health. Uh, I hope none of you have been involved in maternal mortality cases, uh, but if you have, you know, each case is reported independently to embrace and investigated by a, a series of external examiners. All notes are made available to them. Each case is summarized in what's called a, an embrace vignette, kind of summarizing the, 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 the scenario. 
Um, and then independently, each of the assessors will provide an assessment of how good the quality of care was, starting from pre-pregnancy all the way to, to the point of outcome. And you can see about one in three of the cases investigated, uh, the examiners found that improvements in care which have made a difference to outcome. With each embrace um, set of cases, uh, recommendations come. Uh, I, I've put here just an example of a couple of them that have kind of accumulated with each report. Uh, for example here, uh, that all women with pre-existing cardiac disease should be offered pre-pregnancy <laughs> counseling. Um, and then in addition in 2019, that anyone with a family history of aortopathy or channelopathy should be referred for cardiac assessment pre-pregnancy. So these are non-binding recommendations from, from the committee. Um, and uh, there was really no enforceable way of bringing these into clinical practice um, until eventually in 2021, NHS England uh, responded to a series of documents and um, uh, for example, the, the Alcon report in the Telford and Sh uh, Shrewsbury's hospital um, maternal services and the Better Births um, program and basically decided to create these maternal medicine networks so that every woman in England with an acute or chronic medical problem would have timely access to specialist preconceptual uh, uh, advice and care during and after pregnancy. And this is included in now the maternal medicine service specifications uh, and everyone in England is now covered by uh, these, uh, this framework. So between 2022 and 2023, uh, 17 maternal medicine networks have been created across the UK, so there's 12 across the country and five in London. Uh, they uh, overall cover similar populations. Um, and as one of the key performance indicators, so what we will now be judged on every time there's um, uh, a case of ill health, is the, the, the access to PPC or pre-pregnancy counseling advice uh, for all women with chronic conditions. The, each maternal medicine network now has a, a statutory role. So there's a lead midwife, a lead obstetric physician. So that is a, a physician particularly trained to la look after women with chronic or acute conditions in pregnancy and an obstetrician uh, specializing in maternal medicine. So three uh, leads for each region. And um, for each condition, it could be rheumatology, respiratory, etc. The goal is to divide or assess each condition as category A, B, and C, as you see there, and kind of allocate w care pathways for how severe disease is. So category A conditions are considered mild, which could be um, uh, looked after at the local maternity hospital. Uh, category B are intermediate, uh, so to say, uh, and the thought is that uh, at least at some stage during pregnancy, uh, women will be reviewed by a specialist in the maternal medicine uh, center in the hub. And finally, category C conditions, which should be led um, uh, uh, most of the care uh, in the maternal medicine uh, network. And for example, I show you there how we split it in uh, my network, which is Southeast London. Uh, we have two hubs for maternal cardiology, which is at St. Thomas's uh, and at King's Denmark Hill. So to improve care of uh, women with, with cardiac disease uh, going through pregnancy, um, we have these like four main periods where we can make the difference. We need to, to institute pre-pregnancy counseling where women are pre-assessed. Then we have a, a team to look after women during pregnancy where the goal is just adjust therapy, reassess. We have a, a final like reassessment towards the end of pregnancy where the goal is more or less plan where, how, and the mode of delivery. And finally, um, the bit that we really don't do well at all is the postpartum care, uh, where normally as soon as the baby's out, kind of everyone relaxes and goes home. Uh, actually, that is the period of uh, uh, increased morbidity and mortality. So pre-pregnancy assessment, why? Uh, so here are some anecdotes from, from the clinic I've established in the last 12 months uh, at King's and just as some of the uh, women I talked to during pregnancy rather than pre-pregnancy uh, and this is reflected in the experience of uh, I presume most of you that have looked after women that are pregnant uh, stopped taking medications because Googled uh, and the medications that she was on were, were deemed uh, unsafe or she was unsure. Uh, a GP or a midwife told her to, uh, to actually stop taking medications until review by a cardiologist. Um, previously told must not get pregnant or should not get pregnant, so actually didn't present to medical care, uh, kind of afraid to be told off. 
Um, uh, by the time I saw her uh, in late pregnancy, someone told me that they've been uh, advised that all cardiac women should deliver by C-section. So we kind of had to quite unravel that in the few weeks before delivery. Um, a lady with known aortopathy, um, lost to follow-up, no recent tests, and that's despite actively going through IVF. Uh, so it's not even the spontaneous pregnancy, someone actively trying to get pregnant. Uh, and uh, routinely, um, several women with inherited cardiac conditions that were not aware that PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing was even a, an option. So these are the anecdotes. Um, a little bit of evidence, not tons. Um, this is a meta-analysis uh, published last year by one of our colleagues at St. Thomas's, uh, Melanie, where they looked at all the trials involving pre-pregnancy counseling, not just in cardiac, so across all medical conditions. And um, they showed that there was significant improvement in uh, adherence to uh, medications in patients that were pre-pregnancy uh, counseled. In terms of cardiovascular health, um, they demonstrated that actually better outcomes, both for mum and for uh, babies, so reduced rates of C-section, reduced rates of preterm birth, better APGAR scores and uh, lower birth weight. But actually they demonstrated, which is anecdotally what most of us see, is that uh, there's this impression that women that currently ex uh, are accessing pre-pregnancy counseling are younger, more educated, going through IVF. Uh, most of the cases of women that come to me for pre-pregnancy counseling ask for it. They ask to be referred. They, they, they looked for this information or even self-referred. Uh, and this opens up uh, a big problem with inequity of access. So actually a lot of the women that are high risk um, are not being systematically put in the system. Uh, and those are where we see poor outcomes. In the UK, uh, maternal mortality is four times higher in women of African ancestry compared to Caucasians and about two times higher in women of um, Asian uh, backgrounds. So all that puts into, uh, feeds into that for outcomes. So now a little bit more of data. How do we actually risk stratify women uh, thinking of pregnancy? Uh, there are several risk scores, some more complicated than others. Um, and uh, I put there the AUCs or the, the predictive powers is not too bad. Um, but some of them are quite complicated. And one of the best performing is the one uh, that I show you there, the modified WHO classification of maternal cardiovascular risk. Uh, it is very simple in that it divides conditions mainly by structural um, or very easy phenotypes to observe, like um, the, the degree of ejection fraction. Uh, and it divides all conditions into five categories. And I'm not sure how, why they did this, but it's one, two, two to three, uh, uh, three and four. And as you go towards the uh, right-hand side, the conditions are more severe, um, and if you see at the bottom, they're associated with increasing risks of maternal morbidity and uh, mortality. And they're ballpark figures, but it kind of puts into perspective, uh, and it allows us to, to, to communicate risk uh, with, with women. And the impression of most people that do maternal cardiology is probably they, they, uh, that the risks are slightly higher than we, what we see in, in real life, for example conditions on the, on, the, um, on the last row have somewhere 40 to 100% risk of severe morbidity and mortality. It's probably slightly uh, less than that, but still. So pre-pregnancy assessment, who to refer? Um, you'll see more or less and everyone uh, that you will look after should be referred. Um, so ESC, um, Maternal Medicine Network guidelines, ACHD guidelines show, uh, recommend any women with previous uh, structural heart disease uh, with cardiac surgery, with known cardiac disease, uh, as per the previous um, table, particularly those MWHO 2 to 3 and uh, 4. Um, in terms of our patients, women with family history of an inherited cardiac condition, cardiomyopathy, orthopathy, channelopathy, uh, particularly there was quite a few vignettes in the last few embraces of women that were genotype positive phenotype negative at previous assessments, so they were deemed okay uh, and decompensated during pregnancy. And also interestingly, quite a few cases of relatives of patients that were genotype negative, that was misunderstood as this not an inherited cardiac condition, particularly in, uh, there were two cases of aortic dissection where uh, the sisters of the patients that died had dissection genotype negative, so they were deemed at booking to be no risk, so they were not screened. Um, I have there uh, women planning to go uh, assisted reproduction uh, with a lot of risk factors for cardiac disease. Uh, again, the, the subgroup that has seen the highest increase in maternal mortality has been those 
with um, risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, um, undergoing IVF uh, and advanced maternal age. And finally, systemic conditions or syndromes uh, that are sometimes not under cardiology, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to pick up uh, at screening syndromes that you'll recognize, Marfan syndromes, vascular Ehlers-Danlos, and the DIFT group. So maternal cardiovascular, um, uh, maternal cardiology pre-assessment is all about physiology, and this is the one graph that more or less summarizes it all. So as you go through pregnancy, um, women uh, ex uh, experience or develop a, a marked increase in heart rate, about 20% increase, uh, associated with increase in plasma volume, which put together increases the cardiac output by 50%. Oops, sorry. And those changes occur within the first trimester mostly. And then all those changes get reversed within the first four to six weeks after delivery. So you can see the cardiovascular stress that happens in such a short period of time. So the principles of pre-pregnancy risk assessment really surround um, estimating the risk that this physiological changes will put on, the, on our patients. Um, and likewise, uh, estimate the effects of disease and treatments by put on pregnancy. So the principles uh, of pre-pregnancy risk assessment I put there, aim to review within four to eight weeks. Uh, it is, uh, I don't have much research to show you, but is the general experience that uh, when women start, or families start thinking about uh, pregnancy, if you don't get to see them quickly, they come to pre-pregnancy uh, clinic pregnant. Uh, when they mean thinking, they mean they stop taking the pill or taking the IUD uh, out. Um, Pre-pregnancy is a multidisciplinary uh, assessment. Um, so the model that we use in most network centers in, in London is a combined maternal cardiologist, an obstetric uh, physician, and an obstetrician. And uh, we also are as well to have, um, uh, where we work, uh, one of our ICC nurses to join us to help with genetic counseling and genetic testing. Um, I'm, I'm a, big fan, a big fan of uh, stress testing. Uh, in heart muscle disease, so uh, change or alter medications to, to make it uh, pregnancy compatible, and then simulate the physiology of pregnancy, and that invariably is a, a stress echocardiogram, uh, so take patients out of their entresto or in DAPA, wait for three months, and do a stress test and see if there's a uh, contractile reserve and what their ejection fraction is without all the, the treatment. Um, we try to optimize maternal health. That is all um, to do with uh, weight loss, stop smoking, vitamin D, supplementation, but also the procedures that might be required to the tests that are difficult to do during pregnancy. So if they haven't had their aortic dimensions measured recently, do their CT, do their MRI. Um, and finally, talk about the blueprint of maternal and fetal and neonatal care. Uh, get them engaged on what uh, a pregnancy with cardiac disease will look like. It's also very important to talk about pre-implantation genetic testing. Uh, you'll know PGT is available on the NHS, but you'll see the uh, longish list of um, uh, inclusion or exclusion criteria better. Uh, and you see for quite a few of our patients achieving a BMI under 30 by the time they're under 40 years old, um, and taking into consideration that waiting lists in some centers are uh, a year or two. Um, really puts a lot of roadblocks, so you have to really plan ahead and do that referral quite early on. Um, and again, uh, alternatives to PGT and to, to carrying their own pregnancy adoption, surrogacy are also very complex and difficult, so it's also something that you should um, advise on and start earlier rather than later. During pre-pregnancy counseling, we go through every single medication that uh, women are uh, on. Uh, my advice is, uh, really don't look at the BNF, so don't quote me on this, but uh, <laughs> the BNF will tell you that every single medication is contraindicated in pregnancy, so it's not really helpful. Um, uh, one of the really good websites I recommend, uh, and it has a uh, patient-facing uh, information, is BUMPS from the UK Teratology Information Service, um, and that is very reassuring, and it has uh, additional uh, information for, for patients. Um, I, I, really, I know it's a cliche, but it, it really is an individualized and shared decision making because uh, apart from a few exceptions, um, which are not controversial, ACE inhibitors, Entresto, Dapagliflozin, 
uh, which are contraindicated in, in, in pregnancy because they are teratogenic. Um, the, the, for example, the ACE inhibitors cause renalogenesis, uh, oligodramnia, so those are really out of the question. But most of the other drugs uh, lie some balance between maternal health, fetal health. Uh, they might not be suitable in first trimester, might we could do without in the first trimester, but not uh, in the second. Uh, one of the examples there uh, just next to uh, is spironolactone or therno. It causes um, uh, feminization or of the male uh, genital tract or male fetuses, but that is based on no human data. Uh, it's based on rat data where the doses are about 200 milligrams of spironolactone that did cause that effect. Um, uh, and again, if we know the, the gender of the baby, we probably know, uh, like we can titrate the, the risk estimate. Uh, I start talking already about compliance pre, during, and uh, post-pregnancy. Um, and I don't have time today to talk about anticoagulation, but that's what really keeps me up at night is anticoagulation of um, mechanical valves. And that is a very, very uh, complex and, uh, and sensitive area where it's judging, again, heparin versus warfarin throughout pregnancy. Let's talk about contraceptions. Uh, and I try to show images similar to this where about 25% of couples that use condoms or uh, fertility awareness plans um, get pregnant within a year. Um, so we try to talk about other methods of contraception that are slightly more uh, efficacious. Um, my advice um, it would be long-acting reversible uh, contraception, so IUDs, maxplanon implants. Um, most women or many women uh, pick uh, oral contraceptives and um, it's difficult to have a, a rule for everyone, but in general, women with cardiac disease, uh, progesterone-only pills are usually preferred because they are associated with less thromboembolic risk. Um, obviously, there's a rule and there's an exception. Uh, there's mounting evidence that um, uh, progesterone-only pill uh, increases the risk of cardiac events in women with uh, long QT. Uh, those uh, increased risk is negated by beta blockers, so it's either don't give them progesterone or give them uh, beta blockers, uh, but probably avoid if possible. During pre-pregnancy, we already talked about the pre-pregnancy care, or like this blueprint of care I told you, and it could be quite intense depending how severe the cardiac disease is. Uh, so on top, I show you a mild to moderate disease, where the recommendations are to see preconception at the end of first trimester, end of second trimester, and pre-delivery. Then again, pre-discharge and uh, at a period which is about four to six weeks post-delivery. So that's the light version of it. Um, more and more guidance has been coming through from the ESC and also now from the, the UK Maternal Cardiology Society in terms of imaging and other follow-up. Uh, and you'll see from that table, patients with cardiomyopathy could, could expect, for example, an echocardiogram somewhere between every four weeks to weekly, uh, depending on their degree of uh, ejection fraction impairment. So it's really quite an intense um, schedule of follow-up and we really have to prepare our patients for it. Um, there's also the, the pregnancy care for, for, for the baby, for the, for the fetus. Uh, and again, I'll show you there an uncomplicated pregnancy, so no other issues arising. So women on the NHS are, uh, have uh, fetal scans at 12 and 20 weeks. Uh, if there's structural disease, we offer them a specific um, fetal echocardiogram at 20 weeks. Uh, but then we add in um, uh, growth scans uh, at 28, 32, and 36. Um, and this bit is quite well received. They, 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 they do uh, attend and uh, enjoy additional uh, fetal scans. And depending on the drugs, we also talk about some fetal or neonatal implications. For example, uh, babies of mums on beta blockers are expected to, write, to wear these little, cute little red hats when they're born uh, as a risk of, uh, their risk of hypoglycemia. Very quickly, just a, a slide on each cardiomyopathy or the most important uh, cardiomyopathies. Uh, this is by no means Exhaustive uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Like I said, pre-pregnancy exercise test is a very good predictor of outcomes. So uh, a good uh, exercise tolerance on pregnancy compatible medications is a good prognostic factor. Um, try to avoid diuretics or really review if diuretics are required because they do cause uh, uh, IUGR. Um, mild to moderate stable disease, asymptomatic disease, there's really not much change to obstetric care. Um, more severe or decompensated heart failure near term uh, really is an individualized delivery plan, and uh, yes, severe heart failure that is compensated, we do talk about C-section, and more than the physiological thing is to have the right team around during the right time of day at the beginning of the, uh, of the week rather than uh, at 3 a.m. Uh, on a Sunday. Um, 
deaths are relatively rare. Um, there's not a much, uh, much data, but about 5% uh, mortality of women with DCM. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, generally well tolerated. In severe HCM, AF is not. Uh, so uh, achieving sinus rhythm during pregnancy by normally uh, DC cardioversion is, is desirable. Uh, LV diastolic function, LA size, outflow tract obstruction are the main risk features. And as we saw today, really having a plan for outflow tract obstruction uh, before pregnancy is uh, really highly desirable. Um, and again, there was a, a vogue at some time to, to uh, deliver every patient with HCM by C-section. It's definitely not supported by evidence, and uh, we um, have, uh, all our patients have been delivering by, by vaginal delivery. You'll see, um, although mortality is very rare, um, around 0.5%, uh, symptoms and, comp and, uh, and uh, um, complications are not rare. About 30% of patients with HCM have some sort of arrhythmic heart failure uh, decompensation during pregnancy, so they need to be closely monitored. Arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, um, again, very, very limited data. Anecdotally well tolerated, but all, uh, F2P and non-sustained VT are much more common in all pregnancies, and particularly in ARVC. Um, uh, implantable cardio uh, defibrillators should really not alter obstetric care. It's really a hospital by hospital guideline. So for example, I work across two hospitals and one we keep ICDs on during delivery, even if it is C-section. At the other hospital, we have to deactivate it. So it's just, um, we have to fine tune it. Um, and the question remains, does pregnancy accelerate disease? Um, I think no big study has shown that it does. Um, but if we explore some of the Kaplan-Meier curves of, of some studies, you, you got to wonder that perhaps the studies are just underpowered uh, because th those graphs seem like they're divergent to me. Long QT, um, again, prepare women for, for regular ECGs in pregnancy. Um, talk about the effects of beta blockers um, in terms of fetal uh, growth, slightly lighter babies at birth, um, 100 to uh, 200 grams lighter. Likely that the beta blockers need to be increased to keep up with pregnancy. Really fundamental that don't stop the medications. Um, we also talk about uh, really treating uh, nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, hyperemesis quite aggressively in early pregnancy uh, because all the vomiting, the electrolyte imbalance, not being able to take their medications really expose them to uh, potential arrhythmic complications. And actually most of the hard work is done talking to anesthetists uh, uh, about the drugs you can or cannot use uh, at the time of birth. Uh, I, I give long QT just for a quick uh, example of considerations during pregnancy about this interplay between mom and fetus. Um, and long QT is probably the, the most interesting of those. Uh, so the incidence of miscarriages in women with long QT uh, is twice as high as the, the general population of stillbirths. So baby uh, fetus uh, demise after 28 weeks is eight times bigger in patients with long QT than the general population. And interestingly, it's independent of the fetal long QT. So this uh, uh, maternal issue uh, and why that is is still not clear. Probably something to do with the, the myometrium, so the, the, the muscle of, uh, uh, of the uterus. Um, and again, that graph really shows that interplay of ICC team teamwork. Um, about 20% of all uh, fetuses beyond 28 weeks um, die either uh, by stillbirth or within the first 15 uh, weeks of life. Uh, and really shows the importance of working with our colleagues in pediatric uh, cardiology and fetal medicine um, uh, throughout. And interestingly, we also have <coughs> increasing numbers of women that we dis diagnose or parents that we diagnose with long QT via fetal diagnosis. Uh, so about 12% of all parents of babies with bradycardia, two to one block or VT in the womb have long QT diagnosed. It's very interesting. Uh, quickly coming to the end, just a couple of slides on, on aortopathies. Uh, aortopathy is probably the most advanced bit of uh, pregnancy risk stratification that we already have some genetic information in there um, by, by syndrome or by, by gene. We're able to, to better risk estimate uh, the risk of dissection during pregnancy. And we have different thresholds uh, at which we recommend uh, aortic surgery in preparation for pregnancy. Unfortunately, pregnancy really is the, the perfect storm for aortic dissection. In each embrace uh, since the start, there has been cases. Um, I think the key message is just update cross-sectional imaging pre-pregnancy. Not huge trial evidence. We'll, we'll probably hear more uh, in the afternoon. 
Um, but we do uh, keep lower thresholds of blood pressure control during pregnancy, treat <coughs> nausea and vomiting, constipation, etc., very well. And the message for, for this and for all other types of uh, investigation for pregnancy is echo normally does the trick, but if you can't see what you need to see, then MRI is perfectly acceptable. Uh, we use CTs for dissections, but we can do CTs for uh, other conditions or other cases if we're not getting the information we need, for example, from MRI. So really, the, the goal is getting a diagnosis. So excluding one diagnosis is not the answer. We need to keep going until we know what's going on. So final few messages, straight from the SC. Vaginal delivery is recommended as first choice in most patients, so we can help all start dispelling that myth that cardiac women need to be delivered by C-section, and there's only very few cardiac indications um, for delivering by, by C-section. Another slide stolen from Embrace, highlighting what I told you all along, postpartum is really the high-risk period. So we do a reasonably good job monitoring women during pregnancy and during the couple of days after postpartum, and then the obstetrician stops stop seeing them, we send them to GPs, there's no linkage to our ICC services, and these women are not followed up. So most mortality is in the, uh, in the few weeks after delivery. So this is when we really come to play. So that's it. Um, in terms of conclusions, I hope I showed you that um, we need to talk about reproductive options and contraception more regularly in review. A lot of what I talked about is something that we should try to um, talk at uh, most of our appointments. Um, but it's really quite a lot to cover in a single consultation. Uh, guidance and regulation really has moved PPC from a nice to have and is now the expected standard for care. So we really have to work with the maternal medicine networks to really have more formalized pre-pregnancy counseling. Um, this is a multidisciplinary um, activity, uh, definitely essential for complex disease. Postpartum period is the high-risk period. Don't forget the, the fetus and the baby and um, make use of your colleagues in maternal cardiology and the network. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we can allow a couple of quick questions. So any questions from the audience? I think there's one right at the back. Uh, thanks, Antonio, brilliant talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. I wondered um, if you knew what proportion of maternal deaths are caused by undiagnosed uh, cardiac disease, inherited or otherwise, and whether you felt there might be a role for screening ECG at the booking in appointment. That, that's very interesting. Um, so I can't remember the exact number. I think it's 60% of all women that died did not have known cardiac disease. But it's really such a mixed bag in terms of some of those did have family history, some of those have. Um, uh, diagnoses that were not recognized at, at risk, such as Brugada. Um, so it's a really mixed bag. Uh, I think this, the solution is something like that, like a systematic uh, approach. Uh, there's a lot of training going to uh, a one-minute cardiac screening uh, for midwives, so asking just two or three questions in terms of any of her relatives died under the age of 40, um, any sudden death, uh, thing, uh, things like that. So I, I think from those, at least from those patients, then they will require further assessment and, and perhaps uh, an ECG. For example, in the hypertension, it's already standard. Anyone with a diagnosis of hypertension in pregnancy gets an ECG, so it's not, it would not be hard to incorporate into standard protocol. Thank you. Um, now, we have had questions uh, being submitted virtually as well, and there's one that's particularly suited to Terry Elliott. Um, this is uh, a question asking for advice from a DGH cardiologist um, about this thorny issue of LVH in the elderly and, and, and what you do with it. And, and uh, I'm sure, like us, we spend a lot of time in NDTs debating this. Have you got, can you um, simplify and summarize how you would approach that in about a minute? Okay, it's phenotype, phenotype, phenotype. So the age is important in terms of differential diagnosis. Um, perhaps most relevant to hypertension and gelated septum phenotype, which I suspect is where most of the confusion arises. Um, particularly relevant for amyloidosis. Um, but it's, I always start with, you know, yes, the age, the context, but then what does the heart and the ECG look like? So it's perfectly possible to have sarcomeric protein disease with a septum of 2.5 centimeters 
spiral distribution down to the apex. The fact that you're 75 doesn't mean that it's not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I think follow the principles, follow the pathway, follow the cardiomyopathy mindset, take a good family history, look at the phenotype, and then decide what the most likely differential diagnosis is. If there's no family history at all, the patient's got a long-standing history of hypertension, 13 millimeters, angulated septum, that's almost certainly not sarcomeric disease. If you can't tell the age of the patient from the echocardiogram, and it looks like sarcomeric disease, then it probably is sarcomeric disease. And, and, and what about a little bit more in the gray zone, as you sort of give, describe two extremes there, what about the 18 millimeters of septal hypertrophy in an overweight 70-year-old hypertensive? Yeah, absolutely, and it's not an unusual phenotype, but again, it depends on the phenotype. So you can't describe the Hokum phenotype from a single wall thickness measurement. Sure. So if, you know, if you've got deep T-wave inversion, goes down to the apex, the apex is, you know, that's the key thing. There are going to be obese patients, usually male, usually, you know, often sleep apnea, and the data would suggest the majority of those don't have a, at least a, a rare Mendelian variant. But again, the context is important. So it's the phenotype in context, and then the a priori probability that this patient has a familial disease or not. Okay. And something that Professor Watkins has mentioned in the past is, is the potential role of gene testing in that situation, not to categorically exclude, but to sort of alter your post-test probability and make it less likely that it's familial disease. Is that, that, I mean, that's not what the guidelines would tell us to do, but has that got a role? Perry's completely right. If it looks like HCM, the genetic test is really valuable, and sometimes it is. And even if you're not sure in the gray area, it's not a very expensive test, and it will alter how you cascade and, and handle the rest of the family. So I would like to see that age limit go up. I mean, we do have discretion, but I suspect people look at the guideline and go, oh, they're a bit old, I won't test them. I think we should. And Most. I mean, it, it, it's a somewhat expensive test, but it's not really expensive. And, and, and if you're going to use it to say, oh, okay, I'm not now going to do as much family cascade screening uh, if it's negative, you, you get the money back. Yeah, great, thank you. Well, I think we should stop there. I'm sorry we haven't had quite as long a discussion as we'd, we'd intended. We are running somewhat behind. Um, we'll shorten coffee break. If you can come back for 25 minutes to 12, that would be fantastic. <laughs>